last day class that I didn't uh, oh let's get this sorry. Um, on the lecture on Tuesday there were one or two slides that I didn't get to um, finish. And I thought I'd start with those today, but actually I'm not going to do that. I'm going to just start with today's lecture because it kind of overlaps a little bit. Um, that's okay. So anyone, uh, it is wise to have a look at um, Tuesday's lecture. If you weren't here or even if you were because you didn't finish the last couple of slides. Now, what I want to say is before I today's lecture and there are quite a few slides here and I want to try and get through them and um, just I'll, I'll talk about this next week as well I won't be here on Tuesday and uh, Dave McDonkey will be here on Tuesday um, I can't remember where I am but I know after this I'm going to live with and I know that this is just starting just this week and I know next week I think uh, I can't remember where I am but I'm in Estonia so uh, I think I'm in Glow so there's a lot of those running out of the moment. Close the door here. Students just come for some time. Um, so Jane is here on, on next um, Tuesday talking about services for families and uh, perpetrators, victims, mothers and children and the whole lot his service so he's going to tell you all about that and i want to come back to that now in half a second and then on, on thursday which is the last day of the semester we have laura sweeney uh, detective sergeant coming in from harper terrace to talk about investigating from a police perspective domestic abuse and she is honestly i said my is incredible but laura is just an amazing woman and um, we get a minute at the end of i can tell you how i met her first but she's an incredible woman. Uh, with a guard in Donnybrook for years and various things that she's done in her time. But she's the most incredible woman uh, investigating domestic abuse. Uh, so that's Thursday. So what I'm telling you all that is in car fee the paper. So I'll tell you more about this uh, on Thursday as well. I'll grab three minutes of Laura's lecture. From part B of the paper, there are two questions. So you again, you already have part A. But part B, there are three questions, and you need to do one, the same thing, and you've an hour to do it. So you've an hour to do question A, an hour to do question B. And it is advisable to use your hour, like read your paper first quickly, but you'll you know, because I'm going to tell you, by on Thursday, uh, broadly the area. So you'll have a good idea which area you're focusing on, even on question B. Um, so you don't have to take hours reading the paper and wondering, hmm, would I do this question or that? Um, but, uh, so take a couple minutes to read the paper, but then do give yourself your hour for the first question and your hour for the second question. I tell you this, it is really, really uh, awful. I feel sad for the student when I read a most incredible questionnaire that is an A+. Plus. And it's clear that the student, if people get A pluses in, in one hour, but this student has spent an hour and three quarters, and the question D, or the question B, has had 15 minutes, and it's a, B it's a D minus or something. And that student, that is clearly very good, becomes like a C, or a C minus, or something, which is not a bad grade, but nonetheless, if you're an A. And the only reason that has occurred is because the student spent far too much time on the question and not enough on the other. So even if you know <coughs> loads of things about question A or loads of things about question B or in the B part of the paper, just if you're five minutes before the end of your hour up on your first question, throw down a load of bullet points. It doesn't have to be sentences, just throw them down. Because if you throw them down, I know, you know, and then if the exam, the exam is nine o'clock in the morning. Yes, did you just go? Yeah, and I'm going on to the airport for a 12 o'clock flight. 12 o'clock flight is still in there, so I know I'll be in and out of there in the um, But uh, 9 o'clock in the morning, but by 10 o'clock, you start switching, by, start switching your attention to your second question. Because 
it's really important. You can, I see it every year. The first question, getting really good. Uh, the first question, it doesn't mean it's section A or section B. The first question that the student does gets really high. And then you can see in the second one because of the amount of time. So watch your time carefully. Give yourself, uh, you know, five minutes to the end of each question and throw it out and load one of the It'll do great for me. Now, because all we're trying to assess really is do you know what you're are you answering the question? So in section A you have all those questions. In section B, there are two on domestic abuse. Because really in the second part of the, sec of the, the semester, we've really covered domestic abuse and sexual abuse. And so there are two on domestic violence or abuse course of control, and there is one on sexual abuse, sexual violence. So you have you know your choice. And the two on domestic abuse and domestic violence, just broadly headline them now for you, but I will give you, I won't put them up on blackboard because I'll be sacked, but I will give you, I will give you the questions next Thursday so that you can go off and think about it. Um, so, uh, one is on, in the domestic abuse, it's, it's, one is on services for families and approaches and best practice and so on. And Dave is going to cover that now on, on Tuesday. But obviously, just Dave's lecture isn't sufficient. Like, it's sufficient probably to pass. But it won't be, if you do, haven't read and read around it and did the, you know, weaving some of the other stuff we're doing, it won't get up the grades. We'll talk a bit about that on Thursday, next week. And the other question is on um, impact. I think it is on women and children, and something like, oh no, discuss, it's something like discuss course of control. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the exact words. And offender strategies. And if you're doing the offender strategies questions, you really have to have read John Hennessy's book on how he gets into our head. And uh, Evan Stark's, Ewan Stark's book on course of control. At least I've had a look at some articles. So in the domestic abuse questions, one is on services for families and so on. And you obviously have to weave in a little bit of impact on women and children and then a bit of a small bit of a part of it. But the question is really about services and responses and all that. And then the second question uh, on the domestic abuse thing is more like all the theoretical tells about course control and all that and offenders, offender strategies. And then the third question, if you have a choice, is about victims of sexual violence. And um, it's kind of like therapy and justice and criminal justice and that kind of stuff. So I did a bit about uh, resistance and all those things and the calmness. Um, but that, that question on is on victims of sexual violence and whether the course, it's not, doesn't ask you to do the course to do justice, but it, it, it's broadly about help for victims and what are the issues victims of sexual violence be experience and so you could weave in bits about justice in terms of the court but also therapeutic stuff. So I put up plenty of references and I'll put up, I'll put up a book list and I'll put up a few more, maybe even a, a lecture on uh, justice or victims. I might put a lecture that I have that I won't be able to deliver, but I'll, I'll put that up for you on the victims page. So you have time now to be thinking about your part B as well, right? So today is about impact on um, women and children. So um, let's just put this in context. Um, you know, because I've given you some statistics. Uh, already, that like about a third of women um, have experienced domestic abuse, <laughs> and it is global. And in Ireland, figures are uh, you know kind of similar. One in four, I said, but it's somewhere between one in four and one in three. And um, fem sites are where the the woman is murdered by the partner. And there's a lot of research on that. On women's aid, 
uh, and I've put up there the, the link for women's aid. Yeah. So basically, the point about all this is that there's a lot of domestic abuse happening in relation to women and children. We know what happens for men as well, for the last week. But there's also, just look at this, that some women, 12% of women experience some form of stalking. We saw all the journalists there where the man was convicted recently of harassing online and so on. And cyber stalking somewhere. So there's a lot of this going on. And so I want to talk briefly about the impact on women. And then, and some of these impacts also are on men when the male is late. But I want to spend most of the lecture talking about the impacts on children. Because if this is the extent of the problem, if we say that women and, uh, and men experience this extent of domestic abuse, many of these are mothers and fathers and they have children. So a lot of children are suffering from this kind of So in terms of health and women, there are long-term, short-term and medium-term effects. And it's kind of cumulative. If you're with someone who that, you know, was harassing you or, well, harassment has to be proven over a period of time. I won't go to that because I could spend hours talking about that. Um, but it's cumulative experience of being undermined and so on. We talked about that the other day on Tuesday. But it's, there are contributory factors as well. Culture, race, economic status, disability and age all make it more complex. Like if you're dependent economically or if you're dependent in terms of a disability or if you're in a new country and you know you're already a marginalised group within within a dominant culture, all of these things become uh, add to the problem of how can you get attention? How can you dare to speak about what's happening? If already you're subject to racism in you know in the society, how are you going to or let's say travellers? Very hard. We know that the, there's a huge problem in domestic abuse in the travel population. We just know that. But it's very hard to get travel to talk about it. And we can't get even the advocates of travel to talk about it. Because they feel already, you know, we're going to even flatten ourselves further if we, if we are talking about these things. Um, so all of these factors come into it. So I want to look at the physical impacts. And most of it you know but I, from common sense, but I just want to block uh, up one or two that we might be as aware of. So obviously there's the physical injuries of bruises and broken bones and all that, up to and including death um, by partner. But there are more hidden physical in, impacts, and these are worth thinking about. So insomnia, you know, always alert. Um, chronic pain, exhaustion, um, reproductive health, I want to mention. Women who experience domestic abuse or coercive control are three times more likely to suffer from STIs, vaginal, vaginal bleeding, UTIs, pain during sex, and all that. So something happens around the whole reproductive and, and sexuality thing. And we know that women have, that the last taboo, taboo in domestic violence is women saying that they were raped in their marriage. Like, or we could say, here are the bruises, and this happened to me. But actually, the sexual violence that happens within the context of a marriage, so to speak, or a relationship, is, is something that women have talked least about. So, but we know from the physical evidence that something happens in that community. And this character, like a lot of um, women who have experienced, who are experiencing domestic abuse, it doubles the risk of, of miscarriages. And that's not just from physical, like it's not that the person would be beating you up or something, it's sometimes the emotional abuse and violence that's going on. And what, what some of the literature also shows is that women uh, who are living in domestic violence are often later than <coughs> other cohorts of women to go for uh, prenatal care and so on and have baby children go for it. Of course, you might have an experience that, you know, somebody lived in domestic abuse and they had a balancing baby of 10 pounds. There are always exceptions. When we look at these studies, it's based both broadly on what is, is, is more or less done. But don't forget the sexual and reproductive impact on that and on so now look at emotion.
cultural impacts. Lost identity. We talk a lot about that. The person doesn't know who they are in the end. And uh, often, um, depression, post traumatic stress. It's post traumatic stress is normally reaction to abnormal events. There's nothing wrong with you if you're like with you personally. It's just your reaction to a very complex situation that you're living in with post traumatic stress. Uh, Disorder, if you like. Um, anxiety, phobias, memory loss, cognitive function. Like, uh, you know, sometimes at the end of these lectures, over the years, uh, students have come to talk to me, they have come to talk to us, and whatever, and it might be that they are living in an abusive situation. And like, how are they going to get themselves in to do exams? When you know, every moment of their existence is monitored from afar and whatever. And honestly, you 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 better believe it because it happens and it happens in our lives, you know, probably not miles away from our, our lives. But so cognitive function, you know the way you sometimes you say, I don't know. It's almost like you ask the most simple question and they're looking at you like this. Because their mind is elsewhere, miles away. One year we had a student who um, where they were harassed by another student and he had to make intervention. But the whole worry was in the exam hall that he was saying his mind to me. How am I going to do the exam with him saying his mind to me? So could we organise it that he's saying somewhere else or I'm saying somewhere else? You know? So like there's a lot of uh, things happen. Uh, obviously that's in the student population, um, but in, in, in our world outside. Shame and guilt. It's extraordinary how often men and women who are subject to domestic abuse take on shame and guilt. So, as though it's their shame. And it's understandable because the other person is on the mind so much that they begin to think that something about them is wrong. Parental capacities, parenting capacity undermined. I begin to feel I'm a bad mother because I can't protect my children. Because little Johnny wouldn't go to school today because he had pain in his finger. Uh, but I know he has no pain in his finger. His, but I have to bring him to the doctor because he has pain in his finger. Pain in his finger because of the harassment that happened in this house last night. And I tried to put Johnny and Mary to bed before Daddy came home or the other way around indeed. Daddy tried to put the kids to bed before Manny came home like a thundering uh, mad thing. And uh, but kids here, they know they sense. Um, so I can't protect them. Oh my God, like, what am I going to do? And it's a loss of ability to make decisions. I actually think if you if you find someone who doesn't, it's like there's people who doing decisions, like some people, you know, aren't the most decisive. You don't know what. But if you find someone who absolutely doesn't know, but if they want to have soup or a sandwich, and all the way up to bigger decisions in life. And it's constantly indecisive. I was working with a man recently who, like, he couldn't decide. He, like, when we looked at him, he, he just had drifted in his fifties. He just drifted. Couldn't make a decision about anything. Could, just couldn't. Just drifted around the world. And his wife's getting sick of it. But when we turned it in, history of undermining in family, of him, a bully of dad, never physically violent, undermining bully, and she just went to the room. He was terrified to make a decision, and he's in his 50s. So, lost the ability to make decisions, and as I said the other day, women in domestic abuse are uh, women and all men who have to want to put the target first, and who are just so kind. Also, we matter. So you matter, but I matter. And suicide, like there can be an increased rate of, of suicide uh, for people living in this. Now, the social impacts. So we've mentioned the physical impacts, we've mentioned the emotional, psychological impacts, and the social impacts. Well, isolation. Of course, the control is, a, is, is an ongoing process of, of isolation, harassment, and your mind. But the 
isolation is unbearable for many people. But so the person, man and woman, are isolated eventually from family and friends by the time it has gotten uh, well into uh, ensconced, if you like, in their lives as a pattern. And then that person, that woman or man, is utterly dependent on the partner. And that's exactly how we or she wants it to be, contrary. Limited contact with family then also means emotional isolation. So there's social and emotional isolation, no social. But the financial impacts, very important to remember these, over time, like we have one bank account, but I have, I have control of the bank account. So we've had women, and Women's Aid talk about this, and I used to bring Women's Aid in for different times and different things. And they would say that they have women who wanted to get away at night and who didn't have a bus bill because they're so dependent on things. And some women in Women's Aid, and they're, they're like, they're across all classes. Let's get clear, from grey, uh, domestic violence, etc. across all classes, women went from there. But some women hide like five euro in, in a plastic bag under a pot in the garden in case they ever need to get a taxi or like that. Because they're so financially strained. But what we also find is the the females' assets, if they came into the relationship with money, money or the relationship with money or of some sort, then often the assets are eroded because they are so kind that they give their, you know, when you look at he wants to go because he has to go on a trip here or he has to do something for his work, he has to do an MBA to progress his career, and she pays the 10 grand or the 20 grand or whatever. And so but all that's happening is he's getting more and more satisfaction in his life. And when she decides to start with her 20 grand is coming up. And I've seen on the dance floor of Ireland from women talk to me, because I think I'm telling you, my next book is on dancing saved my life. Uh, because women tell me, and men indeed, on the dance floor, uh, that dancing saved their life. But they tell me also stories about, oh, you see him over there, I was in a relationship with him before. And they'll say, uh, well, he told me he was in Dar Straits. We went out for a month. He was in Dar Straits. I gave him a loan of 20 grand. I said, what? Well, I wrote a little bit in the vegan and had, you know, Big Bob and God. He was trying to separate from the wife and, you know, or his dad's different child needs or something. 20 grand to the end of the And I said, what happened then? Well, then my another friend told me she saw him last week at a or the week after with somebody. This is, and these men, and it can happen with women too. I keep having to say it because more and more we hear this. But they go from one to the other. Borrow, love you, and then borrow, and then everything. So, financial. Now, the secondary victimization takes place through really the responsive services, and Dave will talk a little bit about that next week. But if you're doing the question on services, it's worth thinking about secondary victimization. Because, like, if services are blaming, like, say, child protection, if they're blaming the mother, the bad mother, or undermining her skill or whatever it is, or disempowering her, that can create secondary victimization. Criminal justice systems. If they're, um, I had a friend actually who was a high flying university professor who was in the court uh, for a separation agreement thing, and in the course of it, she was the bigger, well, she was arguing she wasn't the bigger earner, <coughs> and she, her husband was arguing she was the bigger earner. Anyway, of course, it came. But she was a, sub a subject of undermining, constant undermining, never physical abuse, withdrawal of sex for 20 years, uh, which, how would anyone have sex with you, look at you, you know, all that, and eventually she decided to leave. And in the court, the judge said, but she is the biggest she. You're in a claim of death. You're a whatever. How, how come you know, you're telling me that this man owned the money for 20 years? How can in a, in a, basically a professor in a university uh, you know, who knew broadly these topics, 
how can professors in the university just tell you that this man who is like me, whatever, come to mind? Now she actually wrote a report and made a complaint about that judge. She was devastated. Devastated just doesn't begin to describe. It doesn't begin to describe. But let me let me get to put a, a support program in place in plan in place. She was so devastated. And that's secondary victimization. She wrote a complaint to the court, and she was back in, this is the case still ongoing years later. Um, she was back in recently and met the same clerk at the court that she had given him the letter of complaint to. And said, you know, we've had more we've had more complaints about that judge. Maybe. But he's still on the bench. Hmm. Adjudication and family law case. So but that's secondary victim. So Male and female victims. Uh, we have. I. We also have a lot of children who are subjected to this thing, or in many ways involved in it. And yesterday, I was teaching skills to the masters in social work uh, class, and they brought a case. We were actually the theme of the class. A small group teaching, eighteen students. You know, six make a DVD and whatever. And we microanalyzed DVD from a skills perspective. But the case they brought was of a domestic, it, it, the theme of the class was working with men, trying to help social workers get with the program of how to work with men. They used to do a lot of research saying social workers are afraid of men, they don't engage them as fathers, they don't engage them as male partners, they don't engage them in any way, they kind of ignore men. You see, women and children with their clients. Which is problematic. But anyway, uh, but they brought a case from practice, which was because they had done their first case and they're going down their second now. Um, and it was a domestic abuse case of a male uh, by the female partner. And so, and she had left then, then she had had little contact with the children, and he was there six months on trying to manage three kids and so on. I think I told you I have a, a, an acquaintance who two couples used to go together, um, and then uh, the two women got together and left both men, and each had four kids. So you had these two men parenting two sets of four in this little rural island village, and the two women left them in another jurisdiction. So, like, we know men leave women, but women abuse men. And but in terms of domestic abuse, I keep having to make the point, it happens there are male victims, but the stats show there are more female victims than there are male victims. So um, very much so. But anyway, we have these that case yesterday, that man was trying to a victim of domestic abuse, trying to wear three kids. You know, we and the whole thing yesterday was about interviewing this man. None of those kids, kids suffered, even although he tried to protect them from my son. A client of mine recently told me, like upper middle class, and I've been seeing them for a while about different extra familiar things. And the man rang and said, Have you seen him yesterday? And he came on his own and uh, he said, I don't know how to say this, but the wife has taken the own glass of wine with him. And smashed his laptop. Um, I said, how long has this been on? And he said, well, it's going on a couple of years, but you know, this is stress of the extra familiar thing. And he's afraid in bed. And he's afraid in case she poisons him. And that's real. Like we could laugh till you know say it's all over. And the judge might laugh at what? But it's very real. Very real. Anyway, uh, so I'm not going to keep going on about that. But let's say, let's look at now at these children. So, <laughs> the people who write most about this in the Republic are uh, Helen Buckley, uh, Syke, Whelan, and uh, Stephanie Holt, who are in Trinity. And Stephanie Holt is still there, uh, and Syke, I can't remember where she is, but Helen is retired. But, 
like their research is very important. So I put up some, but you know, if you're doing impact on women and children or whatever, their stuff is really important. And in the UK, Hester is, is the person, the reference for her too. Uh, she's the woman who has done a lot of research on impact on children and women. So children are not untouched. Let's dispel the myth. They're neither passive bystanders nor untouched. They, we know there is resilience, and I'll come to that in a few minutes, and children can withstand these things, but let's not try and tell ourselves that children don't know. Children know, even if they don't see. They know at some level of their belief that all is not well in the camp with man and death. Now, so people often say, I'm afraid, I'm afraid to say something to them in case, you know, I'm telling them. It's better after an event, it's better with a child, mommy, let the child on her own with Jake say, I don't know if you heard last night, mommy and daddy were, there was loud words, and whatever, mommy's grand today, daddy's okay, he's gone to work. Mammy and Daddy, this is another problem, we're going to stop it. But I don't know. I hope that they didn't hear, because it is. And if they didn't, their body told them so. Your body keeps the score, body keeps the score with mammy. Um, and children experience with all their senses. Smell, taste, touch, whatever. And <coughs> they don't have to see the fire, the violence, or where, or the subtlety of coercive control to know that it's there. That is the point of that. And so let's think about the impacts on children then. So sometimes children get in the crossfire. I think there's a recent case where, where the boy got in the way and tried to protect the mammy. Or tried, adolescent boys are like this, they say, get in the way and try to protect the mammy. Then it does become physical. Or try to protect the young girl. So they can suffer physical harm. Um, and then they can have behavioural difficulties, either introversion, kid who says nothing at the back of the class, 14 year old boy just suddenly disappearing before your eyes, or this little girl, or start of aggression and anger, a kid that was otherwise grand. And we can put it down to adolescence, ah, oh, sugar, you know, it's adolescent hormonal stuff. Never just rule it out as that. If it's out of character, maybe there's something else going on. School difficulties, self-harm, bedwetting nightmares, and that's Hester there. She's doing really interesting research. So if you get this in children presenting, you have to. You, you just have to ask in your mind. You don't have to ask the parents yet. But you have to wonder. 